Hi, I'm Mark Miller of Agoric. In order to build usable, secure systems by construction, we need to learn how to navigate the attack surface. Of course, security is about reducing risk. Expected risk is just the flip side of expected value. For each potentially exploitable vulnerability, the vertical axis is the likelihood that the vulnerability is actually exploitable and the horizontal axis is the value at risk uh, to the exploitation of that vulnerability. The red surface area is then the overall expected risk of the system. And our goal is to reduce that red surface area in order to reduce overall expected risk. However, likelihood and value are difficult to measure. So we start off with proxy measures. The rows are the various fallible agents. The fallible agents might be malicious or might simply have a flaw that enables them to be subverted by an attacker. And the columns are the resources they have access to and therefore might damage if they misbehave. This is, of course, the classic access matrix. When time sharing started out, it was initially just a way to share a machine among multiple people. There was no protection, so everyone had access to everything. Everything was therefore vulnerable to everyone. The attack surface was complete. Operating systems rapidly invented the notion of separate user accounts, where Alan had access to Alan's stuff, Barb had access to Barb's stuff, Doug had access to Doug's stuff, and Barb could share some of her stuff with Alan. The first row is the operating system kernel, or the TCB. For all of the resources managed by the operating system, the operating system itself is the mechanism that controls the access that the other accounts have to those resources, and therefore a flaw in the operating system uh, is one that places all of those resources at risk. All those resources are vulnerable to operating system flaws. So having reduced risk this much, how can we reduce risk yet further? Well, let's focus in on what Doug is doing in the Doug account, the box in the lower right. If Doug is running a conventional operating system and running installed applications conventionally installed under that operating system, then each of Doug's applications runs as Doug. And therefore, anything that Doug is allowed to do, any of those applications can do. So all of Doug's resources are vulnerable to any of Doug's applications within the Doug box. The attack surface is again complete. In order to continue to reduce risk, uh, let's turn to a research system that I did in the early 2000s named CapDesk. Uh, CapDesk, a capability-oriented desktop uh, built on top of my e-language, which was a object capability secure distributed language. Uh, Cap CapDesk brings the capability concepts out through the user interface. A capability combines designation and authority. In CapDesk, when the user selects a file, for example, in an open file dialog box, it's not just telling the text editor what file the user wants the text editor to edit. That same action also grants the text editor permission to edit that file. After doing CapDesk and E in the early 2000s, in 2007, I joined Google and joined the ECMAScript committee. And for the last 13 years, have been working on the ECMAScript committee to shape JavaScript into a language that can be used for the kind of secure programming that I was doing in E. And JavaScript used in this way is what we call SES for secure ECMAScript. But returning to our research system from the early 2000s, as Doug launches various caplets and grants them authority through the user interface action, these different caplets are given different access to different subsets of Doug's stuff. But E and CapDesk as a whole, those have all the authority that Doug has been given 
under the operating system. And that's the mechanism responsible for subdividing that authority and handing it out to the different caplets. So once again, it's TCB-like. It is a TCB in the sense that it is the mechanism responsible for subdividing and handing out portions of authority to the components within the subsystem it manages. To reduce risk yet further, let's focus in on the cap mail caplet. The cap mail caplet being written in an object capability language, unsurprisingly, the different modules in it have access to different subsets of the authority granted to cap mail as a whole. But I should emphasize that all of these diagrams are not, are not drawn to scale. They're not the way you would normally represent them. I'm representing it this way to fit into the attack surface analysis. But this, for example, is a real import graph of a realistic JavaScript application in this case, um, the MetaMask wallet, when run in normal JavaScript, all of these dots are colored red because any of the modules can completely destroy the integrity of any other module. Everything is vulnerable to anything. When run under SES, the same graph, most of these modules are colored green because we can tell that they're granted very little dangerous authority some of them are still colored yellow or red, meaning that, they're, that in order to do their job, they need to be granted substantial dangerous authority. So any security review can start off by focusing in on the modules granted dangerous authority and what that dangerous authority is. But returning again to our historical system, for the authority that cap desk grants to cap mail cap mail consists of multiple modules one of those modules is the main module that receives all of that authority that's granted to cap mail and that main module is the one responsible for instantiating the other modules the other top level modules wiring them together subdividing the authority given to cap mail as a whole and handing it out piecemeal to the other modules. The cap mail main is written knowing that the address book does not need access to the PGP key ring, so the main module simply doesn't give it that access. That address book, in turn, being written in an object capability language, internally consists of a sparse graph of encapsulated objects uh, that those objects start off isolated from the world outside the module except for the imports and exports. So the decision about in the module design about what it imports and exports is the decision of how authority come from the outside world comes to be threaded into the module. And once again, you would not normally draw it this way. Normally you would draw object graphs. We find ourselves drawing graphs like the one on the left in order to explain code like the distributed secure money abstraction written in SES that appears on the right. So by zooming in through all of these levels and applying the same technique of hollowing out authority at each level, we're getting a multiplicative benefit. To understand it, we can understand it by analogy with fractals like the Menger sponge. If in a fractal, let's say, okay, uh, if in a fractal you remove half of the surface area at every level, then as you proceed through the levels, you remove half times a half times a half, asymptotically approaching zero. That suggests that you, we could asymptotically approach zero risk by these techniques, which is not true. To understand why it's not true, let's zoom all the way back out. This is the picture we get by applying the techniques we've explained so far everywhere we can. And there still remain some solid red areas of undiminished risk. The first of them is what we'll call TCB risk, uh, which is the components at each level of, a, of composition 
which subdivide the authority and therefore by the nature of the job they're doing, their width cannot be reduced. However, we can reduce their height. We can reduce the likelihood for each one that it has an exploitable vulnerability by minimizing the total mechanism and by applying formal methods, ideally verification. Even with verification, the risk does not go to zero, but it's substantially diminished. The next large source of solid red risk is the legacy boxes. Say that Alan and Doug have been convinced to run cap desk, but Barb is still running a legacy desktop of a legacy operating system, running legacy applications, but even Barb could reduce her risk further by running different portions of her world in different virtual machines, uh, partitioning it that way, in which case uh, there's no one component that all of Barb's stuff is vulnerable to other than the virtual machine monitor itself. This, this technique applies again down our levels of composition. Polaris is a system we did at HP running each app in a separate user account and even down at for the individual modules in our memory safe languages, there was always some modules written in C linked in through a foreign function interface. Robert Watson's uh, Cherry hardware uh, shows how you can use that hardware to isolate the bad effects of those C codes so that even if the C code is buggy, it does not endanger the integrity of your memory safe language. So we've applied four different techniques here. We've reduced width initially with principal least authority. Uh, we reduced height by minimizing and formal methods. Uh, we reduced the width of legacy by placing legacy into separate virtual boxes. And most of all, by applying this, uh, these techniques recursively, we've reduced the density um, by this, uh, getting this fractal benefit. However, there's still one big hidden source of risk, uh, which is hidden in the assumption universal to software security, which is given uncorrupted hardware. All software security effectively starts with that hidden assumption, and there's nothing that justifies that hidden assumption. In fact, the supply chain that's delivering our hardware to us, uh, many people have their hands in that supply chain, people, companies, governments, you guys, and all of them can introduce trap doors that are effectively undetectable. And if those trap doors are in there, then everything we're doing in software security becomes meaningless. So to figure out how to address this one, let's zoom all the way out to modern distributed systems. Over here, over here each rectangle is a separate physical machine, but each tower is a logical machine. The tower on the left is a public blockchain, such as Agoric is building, that synthesizes a single logical machine by the massive multi-way agreement of many physical machines that cross-check each other. On top of this, Agoric builds an OS-like distributed system of communicating vent loops, VATs, where each VAT is a process-like unit communicating through IPC within a platform or a cryptographic protocol between platforms. At the next, next smaller scale, we build on top of that a system of distributed secure object capabilities of where an object on a VAT on one platform can send a message for an object on a VAT on another platform. On top of that, we build the world of secure smart contracts. And a smart contract is a great example of a program whose integrity needs to be simultaneously credible to a massive audience, all of those that potentially participate in the smart contract. And because of these supply chain risks, that simultaneous widespread credibility is not something that can be solved by a single hardware machine. It can only be solved by a consensus among many different machines where the machines are located in different jurisdictions so that, so that not even any one government is in a position to corrupt them. And now I will take questions after I turn, after I turn off the recording.